Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are taking a look at the first pattern of revolver that was adopted by the Japanese military. Uh, this happened starting in 1878, and this is a Smith & Wesson number no. 3 new model single action revolver. Now, the, the story of this really starts in 1853 when Commodore Perry sails into a Japanese harbour and basically demands to speak to the authorities. Uh, looking to, to basically open trade relations with Japan. And the Japanese, having had a couple centuries of very insular society, which among other things uh, had extremely strict gun control regulations, to the point that it was basically illegal to manufacture the things, um, a system which was put in place largely to uh, prolong the, the samurai class. You know, it's hard to be, the Europeans discovered this, it's hard to have a class of uh, nobility in metal armor with swords when the peasants can get their hands on firearms. It, it just doesn't last well. Well, in Japan they made it last by being able to effectively prevent the spread of firearms. Well, that left them in a sticky spot when Commodore Perry shows up with a lot of firearms. Uh, interestingly, actually, uh, among the diplomatic protocols that were engaged in with Perry's visit. Uh, this included uh, a bunch of gifts, diplomatic gifts, to uh, to the rulers in Japan. They apparently none of them got to the emperor. They were all hijacked by the shogun. Uh, but this included a wide variety of Colt uh, percussion pistols at the time, 1848s, 1851s, that sort of thing. At any rate, uh, the Japanese start to loosen up on some of their uh, firearms regulations in 1855. Uh, firearms manufacture in some of the provinces is allowed. In 1859 civilian ownership of firearms uh, becomes allowed. And uh, a fairly wide variety of European and American pistols were imported into Japan over the next couple of decades. Uh, Pinfires, percussion guns, and uh, the first one that was actually purchased officially by the Japanese government was the Smith & Wesson No. 2, uh, which is sort of that top break but front hinged revolver that Smith & Wesson did. Uh, they bought a bunch of those for the postal service and other agencies, and interestingly those are actually marked with the chrysanthemum of the emperor. That would be followed by the first actual military order for revolvers in 1878, and that would be the number three Smith & Wesson. Uh, the first ones being the Russian model, um, as were being made for the Russian military. Uh, in fact, Japan would end up being the second largest export market for Smith & Wesson in this time frame, second only to Russia. Between 1878 and 1908, the Japanese military or Japanese government would purchase a little over 17,000 of these revolvers. Now, they came in like four different varieties, so let's take a closer look at this one. Smith & Wesson had a number of different variations on this basic revolver style. Uh, over time, and the Japanese purchases cover four of those different variations. So the first few thousand guns were Russian models, uh, second and third model number three Russians. Uh, once Smith & Wesson finished their Russian contract, they were then able to start making some improvements to the gun. Most notably they improved the extractor mechanism. That became the new model number three, and that would, uh, those would comprise the bulk of Japanese orders. However, by the very end of Japanese procurement, Smith & Wesson had introduced their Frontier model, uh, and that was actually chambered for 4440. Now, all of the previous Japanese purchases had been in 44 Smith & Wesson Russian caliber, and uh, the last guns were, while the, the gun was actually, the Frontier model was actually lengthened, because you needed a longer cylinder for the 4440, they actually replaced those cylinders with 44 Smith & Wesson Russian cylinders for Japanese sales. Um, the guns weren't selling quite so well back in the US, so they figured they might as well you know, throw in the, the old style, old, old caliber cylinder and sell them off to the Japanese. In total, the Japanese would actually purchase something like a third of the overall production of number three new models. And that's what this is. This is a new model. So uh, not all of them had the, the spur on the trigger guard. That could be, some, some orders did, some orders didn't. These guns were not purchased as a single large monolithic batch. They were purchased in really a few dozen small orders of a few hundred to maybe over a thousand guns at a time. Now this particular one went to the Japanese Navy. Not all of them did. There were a lot of Japanese or, uh, government institutions that would use these, including of course the Army and the Navy. However, the Navy ones will typically have 
an anchor like this. This is specifically uh, the insignia of the Kure uh, Naval Base in Honshu. Now this one also has the number 14 marked above, which I believe uh, is just a rack number. That doesn't have any greater significance. The guns were also variously fitted with uh, wood or hard rubber grips. Some of the wood grips can be found uh, with rack numbers carved into them. Um, there are a, very, a variety of other markings um, that are occasionally found on these guns because they were used by a wide variety of different groups and over about five decades, six decades actually, uh, of time. Some of them went to, uh, were, were abandoned and, and recaptured by the Chinese, used by uh, various factions in the Chinese Civil War. Serial numbers are potentially a bit misleading. Uh, these were not shipped in anything even remotely close to a continuous serial number range. Uh, in addition, Smith & Wesson changed models a couple times, and so that reset serial number ranges. Um, but basically, Smith & Wesson's manufacturing process, which was basically piecework, uh, combined with many small orders, combined with uh, different you know, shipments to different agents, different importers. Um, the first batch of these guns went uh, through a company called Aarons and Company, H. Aarons, out of London. Um, that would only last until 1879. This particular example, by the way, is one of the very last Aarons imported guns. After that, uh, they pretty much all came in through a company called Takata and Company out of Yokohama. So you can't really tell anything by the serial number, but there it is for what it's worth. This particular example also uh, is accompanied by an original holster. The holster has just a number in it, um, no particular significance to those markings, unfortunately. This is probably a, a domestically made holster from Japan. Uh, they didn't order holsters with the guns. There really would be no need to. That's something that could be very easily manufactured um, locally by by whoever was getting the guns and, and with holsters specific to whatever purpose they wanted for them. So this one's a little bit rough, but it's a good example of the sort of thing that was used. And if this looks like an American or British or other, you know, sort of late 1800s, early 1900s full flat military holster, that's because that's exactly what this was. And that's exactly what the revolver was. Uh, Japan may have, may have had a, a uh, inferior reputation, especially at the time, but the fact of the matter was Japan would become a major imperial power uh, in Asia. Uh, in fact, the, treated in many ways like a almost a peer by the, the imperial western powers around the turn of the century. It might seem odd that these pistols don't have chrysanthemums on them, given their Japanese official military usage. However, this would actually fit the trend of later pistols. Uh, which do not have chrysanthemums. The Type 26 revolvers, the Nambu semi-automatic pistols, uh, these were not marked with the chrysanthemum, they were only marked with manufacturer's markings. The Japanese were clearly pretty happy with the whole top break system because the first Japanese production military handgun would be adopted in 1894, that would be the Type 26, and it was also a top break style of uh, six shot revolver. Uh, despite that, the production of Type 26s was a little slow to get going, so despite it being formally adopted in 1894, the Japanese would continue to buy Smith & Wessons until 1908. Uh, these guns would serve in the Russo-Japanese War. They would in fact serve in various you know, reserve and rear echelon roles all the way through the end of World War II, because they were really quite robust, quite good. Uh, revolvers. So they are today a pretty cool, fairly rare uh, example of Japanese military arms combined with American production revolvers. So you can fit these into a couple different types of collection, but they're pretty rare here in the US. Uh, there was a small batch of them apparently imported by Interarms in the 1970s. Those are identifiable by the Interarms import stamp that had to be put on them. If you find one without that, it came back through one of many other routes uh, over the many decades. Um, bring back from a, a soldier uh, could just as easily, uh, there are lots of ways these things can get into the US, but uh, pretty cool to take a look at. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.